TCU, BYU, two teams trying to build that tournament resume. My goodness, the Cougars coming off a huge win against Kansas in Lawrence. We have Jake Hatch here to talk about that and more. It's all coming up next on a crossover edition of Lockdown Horn Frogs and Lockdown Cougars. You are Locked On Horn Frogs. Your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Locked On Horn Frogs, Locked On Cougars. This crossover edition brought to you by Nissan. Friends at Nissan might need them to send me a vehicle. I've heard that's a thing, you know, back in the day. Back in the old radio days, people just yeah. get vehicles all the time. I uh, might, might need Nissan to step up in that capacity, but glad that they are a sponsor here. And next to me is Jake Hatch from Lockdown Cougars. And, Jake, I'll tell you, I to, to start this season, not that I thought about it a lot, mm-hmm. but when I was thinking about the new Big 12 teams in basketball, my first thought was, man, I mean, outside of Houston, like, Cincinnati's got a little bit of history, but UCF and BYU especially, I think this is going to be a really tough transition. With this league, it's a, it's a grind. It's just tough every night. But, Jake, I mean, the BYU Cougars are having a great season so far. They're coming off a huge win in Kansas. We'll get to that momentarily. But I guess, first off, are you surprised at how well they've played and how did they kind of prepare to, to make this jump to Big 12 play? Well, you're not you're not wrong because this is a team that was picked 13th out of 14 teams in the preseason poll. The only team picked mm-hmm. worse than them, as you mentioned, is UCF. So, yeah, this, this is a BYU team that has completely overachieved this season, Stephen. And that's the best part about this is uh, this is a BYU team that last year had its worst finish in its run in the West Coast Conference. They uh, were just all kinds of uh, met, all, all kinds of a mess, I guess I should say, after last season. And we were looking at this as as BYU fans out here in Salt Lake City and in Provo, looking at it and saying, okay. You can't compete against Gonzaga and St. Mary's in the West Coast Conference. What mm. makes you think you're going to go up against Houston? What makes you think you go up against the likes of Kansas and Texas and TC, all these teams in the Big 12? What makes you think you're going to be able to compete against them? Well, Mark Pope uh, doubled down on continuity for the most part on his roster. He supplemented a little bit with Ali Khalifa as well as uh, bringing in uh, some other guys on this roster. But the thing is, they have completely overachieved. They bought into the team concept, and uh, they – shoot threes at an astronomically high clip, which has been the big differentiator for them as they've gone about their business this season. So yeah, all things considered, it's been a marvelous year for BYU. And uh, yeah, I'm stunned that they're as competitive as they are in this league. So going to Lawrence, I mean, that's something TCU finally pulled off a win there last season after a decade of being in the league. I know I mean, even programs like Baylor, I think they finally broke through there in their national championship season, but it took a long time. Um, how did they pull that off? The joke always is, Jake, you're competing against Kansas and then the officials as well. You, you, you better hope you have like a 10-point lead late in that ball game. But uh, a furious second-half rally to, to get that done, how did they make that happen against KU? Yeah, they were down 12, and yet you mentioned they made a furious rally in that second half. Here's the thing. There was a technical foul issued to Mark Pope about midway through that second half when the foul disparity in that second half at that point, Stephen, was 15 fouls for BYU against four for Kansas. It was absolutely insane. Mark Pope went out and was just barking at the referees, and they teed him up. And at that point, his team essentially said, okay, enough of this. We're, we're going after it. And BYU, they started making their threes. They made 13 of 34 in this game. Uh, Kansas made just three three-pointers. And and uh, the funny thing about it was Monday, Bill Self said, if BYU makes 13 threes and we make three, that's a 30-point difference. Well, what happened Tuesday night? BYU makes 13, Kansas makes three, it's a 30-point difference, and BYU pulls away with a six-point win. So really, really impressive stuff. Actually, an eight-point win for BYU. Really, really impressive stuff uh, for the Cougars because they easily could have capitulated and decided, you know what, enough's enough. We, we're not, we don't have it tonight. We are playing, quote-unquote, eight-on-five in this game, and it's just not going to work for us. But they refused to give in and they I, I said it on my uh, podcast I did right after the sh- game ended it's the whole uh, mantra of the Goonies Goonies never say die well it's kind of what BYU's kind of been all about this year every time they've lost in the Big 12 and feels like things might be teetering a bit for this BYU team uh, the biggest thing for them is they have been uh, unable to 
uh, bounce back. I'm, wow, I just don't know what happened here to my uh, graphic. But nonetheless, let's see if we can get this back on back online. But the biggest thing for them is they've been uh, able to. Uh, there we go. There you go. They've been able to counter uh, with everything that has uh, been going against them every single time. It seems like the chips are down against them. They just fire back, and they ha- they've they lost one, and then they win the game immediately following that, and that's the mark of a team that just refuses mm-hmm. to give in. Yeah, we got an 8 p. well, 7 p.m. Mountain Time, I guess, 8 p.m. Central Time tip on Saturday night. I'll tell you what, Jake, I used to think when I was younger, I was like, I'm a night owl. Like, I just – I do my best work late at night. And then I started having children and a good job. And I was like, Oh, I just had no responsibilities when I was younger. That was, that was really, I don't know if you're the same way, but as, as I've gotten older, I'm, I'm like, Oh, this is why my parents went to bed at like 9 PM. Like this is just the best, this is the best time to sleep. But do you, do these late tips bother you at all? Uh, they, they are a, an issue considering I do morning sports radio out here, yeah. out here in Salt Lake city. So yeah, that, uh, that messes up with the whole getting an adequate amount of sleep. But, uh, as you mentioned, having kids being married and having the job that I've had uh, doing morning radio for a decade now here in Salt Lake city, let's just put it the way sleep is for, uh, for quitters. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sleep is important. Let me be very clear about that. But yeah, it is It is an issue. The biggest thing for BYU is, though, that they have played some of these games on the road where they've uh, tipped off at noon mountain time, so 1 o'clock yeah. central, and they've lost those games. So mm. uh, there's some there's an emerging theory that BYU is better suited to play at night, and uh, okay. the recent results seem to indicate that. Well, a fascinating thing, too, and, and the point I was kind of getting at there. Uh, they're really good in Provo. I mean, they have been this year, but even in Mark Pope's tenure, I was looking at some of the game notes. It says he's 50 and 10, I believe, at the Marriott Center. That might be a little bit outdated, but bottom line is he's been he's been good, right? Um, at home. What is it that makes, you know, is it just the atmosphere? What is it that makes them so much better in, in their home arena other than the typical kind of home court advantage situation? Well, I think the first thing is they're just comfortable playing in the Marriott Center. They practice in there every day. They're used to the 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 the, just the overall feel of the Marriott Center. But you're right. It, it is one of the more raucous atmospheres. Any TCU fan who makes this trip to Provo is going to be, I think, blown away with the fan section, the, the student fa- student section, I should say, which packs in about 7,000 BYU students. And they're as rowdy as they get uh, out here in Provo. But the entire Marriott Center, it's been close to sold out. This one is expected to be a sellout against TCU, which will pack more than 18,000 people. And it'll be right up to the rafters of the Marriott Center. So, yeah, it, it is it is a raucous atmosphere. BYU fans are very much behind their team. Uh, but it's going to be a fun one. The thing about this is this is a TCU game, and I'll get your thought on this, is that coming off this win against Kansas, that's about as uh, high as you can go in terms mm-hmm. of the the feeling uh but i am extremely wary of this tcu team with jamie dixon leading the way coming into provo because it has all the markings in my mind of a letdown game yeah that's an interesting point i mean i know you, you talked about this earlier jake with byu in one thing just in general in the big 12 is you're going to take losses so you have to find a way to bounce back and not let it snowball tcu's done a good job of, of that as well uh, I really thought they would have a better effort on Big Monday against Baylor. Baylor was coming off an overtime loss to Houston. And in my mind, I was like, okay, man, it's a quick turnaround. You're at home. Just beat Cincinnati. You should That should be a game that you could get a victory. But really struggled to shoot the basketball. Uh, one thing I'm curious about, um, Baylor played a lot of zone in that game. And, and it, it confused TCU. They weren't getting their set properly. Trey Tennyson is their best shooter. Um, and he had an off-night shooting. Is that a club that BYU has in the bag? Is that something they go to often? I just wonder if, if you know, they'll zero in on that and kind of go to that at times because that zone defense gave the Frogs problems on, on Monday night. Well, I, I can tell you this. BYU has used pretty much every defense I can think of in the book so far this season. Okay. Hill Fennell, who is essentially their defensive coordinator, is one of the assistant coaches on the bench. You'll see him literally possession by possession. He'll kind of flash a signal to the guys on the court, and you'll see them go to a 1-3-1 zone on one possession. The next possession, it's switching 1-5, through five, uh, just a man defense. The next one, they can go to a 2-3 or a 3-2. They, they have everything, it feels like, in the book. They'll even go full court pressure if they feel the need to. So it's kind of been a, a, a difference this year on the defensive end because 
last year, BYU very much kind of was set in two different defenses. They had they had a zone they'd go to at times, but they played a lot of man defense. Uh, Cahill Fennell gets a lot of credit this year because he, he uh, proposed that they be able to switch and adjust in game and how they defend teams. So they will uh, utilize a bunch of different looks against TCU. So don't be surprised to see them, yeah, sit in a 1 3 1 zone on, uh, on one possession. And maybe the next possession, if they feel like it, they go to a box and one. Or if they need to switch one through five, they'll put uh, Fuseni Traore on the court as their big man, as a six foot six, uh, five man, and then they'll switch it. They, they have got the capability of doing that. And it's literally been a possession by possession thing all season long for BYU. Uh, when we come back, I want to get Jake's thoughts on uh, this this three point shooting team that the Cougars have. They've really been shooting the ball well this year. That's coming up here on Crossover Edition, Locked On Horn Frogs, Locked On Cougars. Really excited. We're both excited to tell you about Nissan here. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what type of venture you could have around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. Uh, the Rogue, the Pathfinder or Armada, the 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and great escapes. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are all built right in to the HD touchscreen infotainment system. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover yeah. for your next adventure. They also have the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder. Has room for up to eight. Man, I might need that for my large family. An expensive cargo capacity and advanced 4x4 capability. 284 horsepower with 6,000 pounds of towing when adventure calls. The Pathfinder is there to answer it. Or the 2024 Armada, uh, which will change what you expect from a full-size SUV. Uh, you can tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Again, that's NissanUSA.com as a website. If you want to shop, check out the Pathfinder, the Armada, and Rogue 2024 models available now. Uh, get in your next adventure in a Nissan product. All right, we're uh, we're rolling along here. And Jake, you talked early in the show about this team and their three point shooting and how uh, for the Cougars, it's been a huge part of what they do. Is that because of the personnel? Is that a new thing? Is that something that Mark Pope has kind of embraced in the new world of analytics? Why have they uh, Why have they explored that so well this season? Well, Mark Pope's a former NBA player, and he's kind of seen the the re revolution or the evolution, I guess you'd say, of the three ball in the NBA. And I think he's tried to bring it down to the collegiate level. Bill Self said it Tuesday night, he says it's a very much kind of an NBA-esque uh, type uh, offense that BYU runs. They like mm -hmm. to space it out. They like to uh, launch threes with impunity. And when BYU's making their threes, and what I mean by that is they're shooting near 35 or higher percent, BYU's been darn near uh, – unbeatable this season. They made 38.2% against Kansas. Big win. Against Kansas State, the game prior, which they lost on the road in Manhattan, uh, they shot a 6 of 31, just 19.2%. Uh, really, if you look at it, when BYU is hitting north of 35% on threes, they are in every single game they've been in all season long, and they rarely lose those. But when they shoot worse than that, uh, it's a tough deal for them. But yeah, they, they play kind of an NBA style where essentially they, they have the idea of if you're not getting a three on the perimeter, you're going to the rim and trying to score on the inside mid-range game for BYU is kind of a rarity you'll see maybe a guy like Jackson Robinson every so often when a possession is breaking down that he may take a mid-range shot but they very much like to space the floor and attack the rim or shoot that three is I mean I know Jackson Robinson's leading the team in scoring uh, but they look pretty balanced is he the go-to guy is is that if you need a bucket are they finding him or have they kind of spread that around this season They've actually spread it around quite a bit. Uh, this past game against Kansas, uh, Dallin Hall was the big star. He was saddled with foul trouble, played just 26 minutes, but still scored 18 points. Had uh, probably the biggest uh, shot of the game uh, as he hit a three right in the eye of Hunter Dickinson uh, on the perimeter on a switch. And uh, that one uh, was a huge shot. He's had his moments this season. Fusini Traore has had his moments. Jackson Robinson, Spencer Johnson. Ali Khalifa has had a couple of moments as well. So uh, the thing is, BYU feels like the, the, the sum uh, total of their parts as a team so every player on the team is capable of contributing and stepping up in a big moment. But if I were to uh, venture a guess as to if they were down two with uh, three seconds to go and needed to get off a three to win a game, I would guess they'd probably run a set for a guy like Jackson Robinson. But honestly, they've got enough guys. It feels like that they can spread it around if need be. Can we all agree that Hunter Dickinson's the most annoying player in the league? Well, May well, 
Maybe Brock Cunningham. I don't know. He 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 made he made a run for it this this week too. But yeah. one one random thing I noticed about Hunter Jake and and they played TC play Kansas like two months ago. Yeah. But he would make a bucket and he would run down the floor and he did like this, like he would do like a soccer clap to the fans, like yeah. as he was coming back down the floor. And I was like, what is this? Like, is this? Are you playing for Real Madrid? Like, I don't know. It annoyed me. Well, I. Didn't he get into it with some BYU guys? He did. He got a t- double technical on Trevin Nell after he decided he was going to go and take a shot at Trevin in that game. And then later on, he it looks like he got shot as Trevin Nell was just coming through on a screen. And then they play the entire possession. He gets up and keeps playing. And then the referees decide to review the play after the possession has ended and BYU's got the ball. It was just ridiculous. He was doing the raise the roof motion running down the court at one point. <laughs> yeah, night. I did that too. What, what is what is going on here? Like I, I get that he had a poor reputation in the Big Ten, and I wanted to think that it was just uh, uh, jilted fans be, ripping on him. Well, when I saw Tuesday night, I'm like, okay, yeah, this dude is. And I, I said on my Tuesday, on my Wednesday show recapping the game, he is Charmin soft. I'll just, I'll just say that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I was annoyed by him. Uh, can I ask you a question about TCU though on, on that front? Uh-huh. Real quick? Uh, Jamie Dixon, in my mind, because he's a former TCU Horned Frog, I actually saw this. They've made four trips to the NCAA tournament since like the 60s, and he yeah. has been on. He's been either a member or a coach of those teams that has done it. What What has Jamie Jamie Dixon done to transform his TCU team? Because they play with an edge. Yeah, they do. I mean, I think he's. There's been a good mix of you know they still have some of the components of those teams he had at Pitt, where they're going to defend well, they're going to play hard. Um, I think this team is actually one of his worst defensive teams he's had, which is funny. They, they're a little more on the on the scoring side of things, and they can lock you down if they have to, but there's some lapses there. But, you know, Jamie has been super consistent. I mean, he's found athletes that um, can stretch the floor, that can run. And, you know, they want to get out in transition. They want to play good defense and let that lead to their offense. So fast break points are a big part of what they do. And with the transfer portal – The last few years, Jake, he's found a way to kind of rebuild his roster each and every year. This is an old team. I mean, Avery Anderson is a a COVID senior. Emmanuel Miller's been around for a long time. Uh, Chuck O'Banion Jr., my goodness, I think he's working on like his doctorate at this point. This is like year seven for him. Uh, He was at USC, but he's been at TCU now for four years. So there's a lot of experience, uh, and I think that's helped them with the highs and lows of, you know, the of the season. Um, And I it's, it's a weird thing because, as you know, like expectations are low and then you start getting good and expectations raise again. So I think in in some TCU circles, there's some frustration with uh, the nature of they're, they're kind of always like a 500 team in Big 12 play making the tournament and they've won a few games in the tournament. But as you said, I mean, you look at the history of the program, like this is year eight for him. So he's been here a while, but it's literally like, a couple years with Billy Tubbs and some high flying offenses back in the day and Jamie Dixon. And that's it. That's, that's kind of TCU basketball. You know, Kurt Thomas played there and he's probably the best player that's ever come through there. Uh, But there's not a lot of great names or great uh, pedigree. So he's raised the level uh, pretty high. You know, he's done a good job of recruiting the area. Um, They made, they transformed the arena and made it a place that's, better to play, better facilities. So it's kind of been slow and steady, but he's generally gotten his culture there. And I think, you know, he's taking advantage of having a veteran presence through bringing guys in in the portal and finding players that, that fit what he wants to do. I'd say that's the that's kind of the biggest deal with this team. What's BYU's makeup? Is this a team that was trans- – like did they go heavy in the portal in the offseason or have they been developing this for a little while? So they, they went heavy two years ago. Uh, they're going into their final year in the West Coast Conference. They had 12 new members of that team. And actually, the, the fact that they turned it over as much as they did really hurt them. And they opted more for more continuity on this year's team. They did supplement it. Ali Khalifa was brought in uh, from the transfer portal for BYU. And he's been a really, really marvelous find because his mm-hmm. – uh, TCU fans, if they haven't seen him already, are going to see a guy who's got an incredible passing ability that's akin to what a guy like um, uh, Nikola Jokic does for the Denver Nuggets. He's okay. just 
He's got an incredible ability to see the court and just deliver passes with pinpoint precision, giving his guys chances to score. But they they brought a lot of guys back. And what I mean by that is you have a guy like Jackson Robinson, who's his second year in the program. Dallin Hall's a sophomore who's been in, around for quite a while. Trevin Nell, you mentioned Chuck O'Bannon Jr. Trevin Nell's been around BYU, it feels like, for a decade at this point. So, yeah, they they have they have uh, essentially they, – they, 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 both of these teams, to me, scream that they are using the portal to essentially get old and stay old because yeah. veterans – teams win at a pretty high clip and both of them by virtue of what they've done this season they're both tied for fifth right now in the big 12 with a plus five they're eight and seven each so they're above 500 in conference play and they're gonna be scrapping uh, down the stretch here as they try and find their position going into the big 12 tournament and it's a good spot to be in i think all things considered because you mentioned tcu has had a chance to win some games and yeah they'd probably like to see them elevate a little bit but i think for continuity's sake the kind of the steady climb that Jamie Dixon has done. And it looks like with BYU starting to build here as well. Both of them, I think could be, uh, have some staying power in this league. At the elite Khalifa note, I do want to make a mention for all our listeners, just something to watch. Ernest Uday is TCU starting center. He's missed the last couple games with a foot injury. Um, he, he missed the Baylor game. So even Misi had a nice night. So we'll see what his status is. He's been like day to day for a while now. I, I if I had to guess, I think he's going to go, but it, it's something to watch. Um, for for those that don't know, though, I mean, Khalifa's numbers, they don't always jump off the page, but watching this BYU team, it feels like he's such a huge part of what they do offensively. Um, you touch you touch a little bit about the passing, but how important has he been in just kind of uh, the makeup of this group this year? Well, he, he plays a point forward role. And that's the thing about it is he can sit in the high post and he's capable of hitting a three if a guy drops off him, if you if Uday or whoever is guarding him mm-hmm. wants to drop back into the post. He's he he will let the three fly and he'll make it. The crazy thing about this is his turnover to uh, sorry, assist to turnover ratio right now, Steven, is number is is in the top 10 in the country. He's the only guy over six foot four who is in the top 10 in the country. He's nearly seven feet tall, he's six eleven. So yeah. he's not gonna wow you physically. He's kind of a frumpy body. And I, I don't mean that by any uh di- like to make make fun of him he's just he's not very fast he's not the most athletic guy in the world but he knows how to play his style of basketball and it has unlocked a lot of what BYU does on offense it allows guys to cut harder off of screens and the like and if they're open he'll find them in the post and makes for an easy lay in and uh, like I said if he if he needs to he'll step out and hit a three and he even showed against a, a UCF earlier this season he can take it to the rim and jam it he yammed it on uh, uh, their big man Diallo uh, for UCF down there in in uh, in Orlando earlier this season so he is a very very nice player yes his stats are not going to wow you but his ability to contribute in all facets of the game is a big big reason why BYU has been as good as they have all season long well as a fellow frumpy body I appreciate that he's he's getting it done you know you you, you and me both trust me (laughs) he's my type of player let's just put it that way yeah, representation matters. I'm glad that Ali's having a, having a good season for for the Cougs, for all of us out there that that maybe maybe eat a little more uh, fried chicken than we need to, um, mm-hmm. or whatever whatever the the current vice is. We'll wrap it up with some uh, predictions and keys to the game in a moment here on Locked On Horn Frogs, Locked On Cougars crossover edition. All right, we tell you about it almost every day. FanDuel, FanDuel.com slash Locked On. They still have this great deal going on. One $5 bet. If you win it, you get up to $150 in bonus bets, $150 in free money to play with. If you hit on one $5 bet, NBA season in full swing right now. If you want to bet on Mavs game, if you want to bet on Jazz game, uh, individual player props or the team itself, just on the money line, fanduel.com slash locked on or download the FanDuel app. FanDuel is the official betting partner of the NBA and proud sponsor of the Lockdown Network. Again, fanduel.com slash lockdown or the FanDuel app. One $5 winning bet leads to $150 in bonus bets. Make that move today. So, Jake, when you look at this matchup or just in general for BYU, what are some of the some of the keys that you're looking for on Saturday night that would lead to a victory for the Cougars? Well, number one, they got to avoid the letdown. Obviously, they're, they're riding a high. There was a horde of BYU fans who showed up at 2.30 a.m. Mountain Time when BYU got back from Kansas to cheer on the team. And that's always a fun thing, and the team's got to be riding high because uh, to go in there, their very first game as a Big 12 member uh, in uh, Kansas out there uh, and to win that game. The last time BYU beat Kansas at any point, Stephen, it was 1960. It, 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 it had been forever, and they haven't played all that often. Let's be real. They've only played five games up to that point. But to make your first trip, as you mentioned, into Lawrence, 
Lawrence to win there uh, at Fog Allen. It really, really was an impressive win. So they've got to avoid the letdown in this game. You can't go in there just kind of riding a little too high and thinking that you are the man uh, just to a, each individual player. Because if you do that, TC will take advantage of this and they'll, they'll boat race you. So avoid the letdown. The other thing is you got to continue to make your threes at a high clip. They've done that for by and large at home this season. As long as they're shooting at a pretty good clip, I think BYU's got a good shot. What are your keys to the game for TCU? Yeah, guard the three-point line. I think that has to be the, the first key. Find a way to not allow these guards to, to go off and beat you from there. And then secondly, kind of off that, they've actually done a pretty good job of that this year at times. But in their aggression of trying to guard guys in the perimeter, they've allowed some back cuts and other action uh, near the rim. So you, you have to find a way to sort of balance that. I think that's going to be a huge key. And then just shooting the ball better overall, which is going to be tough on the road. But they were so abysmal shooting the basketball against – Baylor, you know, I expect BYU to change up their defensive looks, as you talked about earlier, just to uh, throw them off a little bit. But whether it's Emmanuel Miller or Jameer Nelson Jr., uh, that's a name that'll make you feel old. Jameer Nelson Jr., one of TCU's yeah. main guards. Yeah, that's uh, his dad used to play for for St. John's and the Magic and many other teams. But uh, one of those guys has got to step up and, uh, and and be the leader. Jake, what's, what's your prediction for uh, this TCU-BYU game Saturday night? I'm going to trust that Mark Pope will have his guys ready to go and they will avoid that letdown. So I see BYU grinding out a win here. I can see something in the, in the 70s where BYU scores. It's like 76 to like 71, something like mm-hmm. that. I, I just see both of these teams kind of going toe to toe because they both uh, play a, 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 a nice brand of basketball. You mentioned this is a TCU team that more offensive minded and BYU absolutely loves that. They, they love to go on up and down with teams. I know that uh, that can lead to some interesting uh, games, but mm-hmm. it's more entertaining for us as fans who watch uh, when you have more of these offensive-minded teams uh, playing. So, yeah, I could see this game ending up in the 70s, but I expect the BYU with the veteran nature of this squad, they will be able to kind of handle what happened against Kansas, take it in stride and get the W. What are you, what are you making of it? Yeah, I mean, on paper, this looks good for the Cougars, but I, I think desperation for TCU combined with the fact that they're going to have some extra time off, hopefully figured out some things on offense, scouting BYU well, got a chance to watch that KU game closely. Uh, give me the Frogs 72-68. I think it'll be a good basketball game, great environment there um, in Provo. Uh, before we go, Jake, what's the big storyline for BYU football this offseason? If you had to kind of center in on one thing for the Cougs as they lead into uh, spring ball coming up here soon. Well, we're, we're, we are recording this on Thursday. We're playing it on a Friday. but uh, So Thursday is the, was the first day of BYU spring camp. And the, the conversations I've had, uh, I have uh, Connor Pay, who's one of their team captains, on my show regularly is an NIL mm-hmm. deal. And he mentioned the fact that there's a, there's a mindset shift that's happened this season. They made some changes on the offensive staff, uh, firing their offensive line coach and the tight ends coach, brought in some new bodies there. And the mindset for this team is they were unhappy as they started the season 5-2 and two last year and then lost five straight and missed out on a bowl game. They, they were right there on the cusp of going bowling year one in the Big 12. They want to get back uh, to the postseason. Are, are they expecting to contend year two in the Big 12? Eh, they probably have that as a team goal, but I think more of it is they have the mindset, okay, we had a losing season year one here. That's the only the second losing season since the turn of the de- uh, century in two, 2000. They, they did not like the feeling of being home in the month of December and just sitting on their cans doing pretty much nothing. They want to get back to the postseason. So getting to six and six, I think is the, is the first goal for BYU this season. And that starts with obviously getting a, a better a quarterback, a more steady quarterback play. They brought in former uh, Baylor and a USF a QB, Gary Bohannon to compete with Jake Retzloff at that quarterback position. Uh, if you look at a lot of the betting odds, that uncertainty at quarterback has led a lot of people to think that BYU is going to be the bottom of the big 12 this year. So there is a lot of work for, to be done for BYU, but I think the goal has got to be get back to bowl eligibility, get to six and six, and anything beyond that I think would be a, would be a good sign. Yeah, a lot of similarities to TCU. They're trying to bounce back in a big way. I know BYU fans will maybe cringe when they hear the name Josh Hoover because he burst on the scene last year in that game yes, he in, did. For, in Fort Worth, but it feels like it's his job to lose. So they're, uh, they're trying to build this thing around him, and spring camp will start for them too. Jake, where can people find uh, – Lockdown Cougars and you personally on social media and all. 
yeah, Locked On Cougars, wherever you get your podcast, just search it out. It's also available on YouTube, uh, like Locked On Horn Frogs. Appreciate it, all of the support y'all have uh, given us over the years here. But also, if you want to find uh, my thoughts on all things sports, I'm at Jacob C. Hatch on Twitter. I don't refuse to call it X, but that's just me. Uh, but also, <laughs> check out the show on social media, Facebook, Instagram, or uh, Twitter itself. Just search out Locked On Cougars. Where can they, uh, Horn Frog fans find you? Yeah, Locked On Horn Frogs on YouTube, probably the best place to go, but you can also subscribe anywhere you get podcasts for free and available there. And then at Simcox Steven on uh, Twitter is my handle at locked on TCU is the show's handle. And that's the, those are the best places to go. So Saturday night, uh, 8 PM central, 7 PM mountain time, BYU and TCU matching up in basketball. We'll have plenty of reaction and coverage over the weekend and on Monday on locked on Horn Frogs and locked on Cougars. It's your team every day.